going to introduce Patrick Jankowski, our Chief Economist and Senior Advisor, President of Research for Greater Houston Partnership. Now, he has a very long bio, and he told me to cut it back to 10 of the 48 paragraphs. <laughs> Patrick Jankowski is the Senior Vice President of Research and Chief Economics at Greater Houston Partnership. He oversees the research department, which provides information gathering data analysis and economic forecasting for the partnership's 10 divisions. Skip, 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 okay. <laughs> Jankowski received his economics degree from the University of Texas at Austin, which makes for interesting family gatherings. His son and oldest daughter graduated from Aggieland. I always remind my children they get their education from a and but it's paid for by a UT degree. That's a good one. <laughs> His youngest daughter wisely decided to go to Texas State University in San Marcos. <laughs> Jankowski has worked for the Greater Houston uh, Partnership and its predecessor, the Houston Chamber of Commerce, for 39 years. That'd be a record for most employees and marriages. And, uh, he also has been married to Olga Jankowski for 40 years. They broke another record, which is a record for most marriages. Both have wonderful experiences. Without further ado, let's get him on stage. Okay, real quick, can you hear me? Is the mic working? Great, okay, I appreciate that. Um, as you guys, if you've seen me before, I do, I do pace a little bit. That's the reason why I asked for a lavalier, so. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, you heard my bio. Just real quick, I'm with the Great Eastern Partnership. It's like a, a mega chamber for the region. I just encourage you, we've got the easiest website in the world to remember, Houston.org. Doesn't get any easier than that. I encourage you at just some point to check out our website, find out what we do. Right now, one of the things we're actively doing is we're in Austin advocating for more money for the region, for highways, for education, and so forth. And we also do corporate recruiting. So uh, there are some data that, that my team puts out on a regular basis, and it's free to anybody who wants it. And I'd like to encourage you, we do a newsletter once a month, which is on the left-hand side, where we talk about Houston's economy, Houston being the, the region, we do something also called a key economic indicator. It's like a one-minute read. It's 60 seconds. Just real quick on, on housing or on employment and so forth. If you would like to receive these, and like I said, it is free, go ahead and write down my email address or take a picture, send me an email, and I'll get you on the list. After you've received a couple of them, if you go, I'm not interested, I won't take any offense. Just let me know and we'll take you off the list. But one of the challenges that, that I'm facing, one of the things we're facing, is trying to find good information about the economy because there's a lot of misinformation out there. There's a lot of stuff which is misleading. One of the things we try to do with the partnership is just give it to you straight up and tells you this is what the data means without any sort of political interpretation of it. So just real quick, I want to start talking about the pandemic, COVID. We lost 360,000 jobs over a two-month period. I was very concerned. In a normal year, we create 60 to 70,000 jobs. We lost in two months, equivalent to what, five years worth of job growth. Good news is we've gotten them all back and then some. Since May, when we started opening, we've created over half a million jobs in the region. Think about that, half a million jobs. That little number in the right-hand corner, that's kind of my shorthand, give you some ideas. That's how high above February 2020 we are. We're 163,000 jobs above where we were prior to the pandemic. And you can see it in this chart right here. This is, um, the, it's a fancy term, non-farm non payroll employment. It's basically jobs in the region, in, in the nine county region. Um, a little jagged because job growth doesn't occur evenly throughout the year, some months. We always see some job losses. We usually see job losses in January, always a little bit in the summer. But it shouldn't be any surprise. You look to the upper right-hand side, it's the highest point on the graph. I mean, it illustrates employment is higher now in the nine county region than it has ever been before. We're at a record all time high for employment. Pretty impressive, isn't it? So we've recovered everything we lost in the pandemic and then some, and employment's at an all time high. So this little guy on the left is not the threat to the economy that it once was. It's not the threat. The threat now is from this guy on the right. 
those of you who don't know who this, that's Jerome Powell. That's the chairman of the Federal Reserve. And what Powell and the members of the Federal Open Market Committee are doing, trying to raise interest rates to, to deal with inflation. And the concern is they're going to raise them too high, keep them too high for too long, and crash the economy. Now, they're dealing with something that looks like this, inflation. This is inflation going back to 1980, back when I started my career as an economist. And you can see how high it was in the early part of the 80s. And you can see where it is now. And one thing I want you to take away from this, you can see on the far right hand side, inflation never got as high as it was in the 80s nor has it been as high as long as it was in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. So the question is, you know, inflation's going down somewhat, 6.5%, it had peaked at 9.1. But, you know, that's kind of an odd number. What does it mean? Look, look, loaf of bread now is 51 cents more than it was three years ago. Gallon of milk, a dollar more than it was three years ago. I mean, this is your shopping cart. This is everyday items. Pound of ground beef, almost a dollar more. Actually, it's gone down a little bit. And probably the one that bothers me the most is potato chips. <laughs> yeah, potato chips have gone up almost $2. So think about it. Pound of ground beef, pound of potato chips. Pound of ground beef, pound of potato chips. <laughs> what would you rather have for dinner? <laughs> So, but now I, I just do that to, to illustrate that we hear about all these, these round, you know, it's 6.5%, 9.1% or whatever, but there's real life numbers there, and, and it's, we can do without other things, but we can't do without eating. Egg, eggs are some, the problem with eggs has been the avian flu and the fact that we had to put so many chickens to sleep because of that. So, so we, we like to think that maybe inflation has, has turned the corner a little bit. Uh, it, it peaked at... 9.1%, now it's at about 6.5%, but there's still a lot of warnings out there, concerns that maybe inflation hasn't peaked. It, it may be just slowing down a little bit, and it's, it's gonna take long to get there. So the question is, what has caused inflation? Why is inflation so high? Well, one of it is, we've overstimulated the economy. We injected way too much money into the economy. We passed three stimulus packages, we really only needed one. So if you're going to try to blame it on President Biden, it's not just Biden's fault. The first two were passed under the Trump administration. The third one was passed under the Biden administration. We didn't need the second or third packages. So both presidents have equal blame for this part of inflation. So how much did we overstimulate the economy? $6.4 trillion. Think about it. The U.S. is like a $21, $22 trillion economy. Look how much money we injected either through direct payments or through loans or subsidies or something. Now that's a big number, $6.4 trillion. You kind of lose sight of that. So what is $6.4 trillion the equivalent of? Well, I went and did some research at some of the websites in Washington. That's more than we spent on World War II. Adjusted for inflation, it's more than we spent on World War II. So you think we put too much money into the economy in a three-year period? It's supply and demand. You put too much money out there, you're going to spend it, demand those goods, and you're going to drive prices up. So that's, that's been one of the causes of inflation is we, we overstimulated the economy. We put too much money in it. We needed one package. We didn't need three. So what did we do with that? I mean, the first one, yeah, we spent it. That's what Congress wanted consumers to do. We wanted them to spend that money to get the economy going again. And, and some of we saved a little bit, paid off a little bit of debt, you know, once you kind of inject the money in the economy, but what happened with the second package? Spent very little of that. Most of it went to pay off debt, pay down credit cards, bring those balances down, or saved it. And the third package, spent even less of it. Paid off even more debt and saved even more of it. So you kind of, hopefully you see my point. We didn't need the second and third packages. The first ones did what we wanted to do. So one of the problems out there is, is there's just this, this concept of excess savings. Consumers saved a lot more than they would have normally, and they're spending that savings now, and that's what's continuing to affect inflation. And also having that excess savings, that's one reason why consumers have been able to maintain their lifestyle. Things are more expensive, but what they're doing is they're drawing down their savings to purchase the same amount of goods, using their savings to do it to maintain their lifestyle. 
give you some idea of how much excess savings is out there. This is something that the Fed, Federal Reserve put together, and you can see at one point excess savings were over $2.2 trillion. And it's going down, which is helping. And I am concerned it's going to get to some point to where there's not going to be the main thing. We're going to have to pull back on, on spending because we just don't have the room on our credit cards, unfortunately, it's not, that's not, or uh, not enough savings. So that's been one cause of inflation. We put too much money in the economy. Congress gave us too much. The other is we forget the impact the war in the Ukraine has had. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we purchased from Russia and from the Ukraine, and it's difficult to get those things now, either because of the war or because of embargoes. Now, what do we buy from Russia or the Ukraine? Palladium, natural gas, oil, corn, fertilizer, aluminum, wheat, steel. All these sort of things feed into the supply chain. Anybody here want to know what palladium or primary use of palladium is in the U.S.? Catalytic converters. So if you think about the, ra the, th the, the rash of thefts of catalytic converters, mm -hmm. the price of palladium's gone up. So the thieves are going where they know they can get the money. So that's been one of the things which has affected, affected inflation. There's a school of thought out there that says it's just corporate greed. Corporations are going to charge more because they know they can get away with it. Corporations have been dealing with inflation of their own. This is the producer price index. What corporations are paying for what they need you know, their supply chain costs to be able to deliver their goods and services. And you can see at one time, kind of a, a business measure of inflation was above 20%. And it's gone down, but there's still that pressure of paying more for the goods that need to go into manufacturing things in the U.S. That has affected inflation. And the labor shortage. Uh, does it, those of you out there, I, I assume, yeah, I go to events like this, and I hear people talk about they just can't find the workers. They just can't find the workers. If you're, I see some heads nodding. It's so, so what happens if there's a shortage of workers? You have to raise wages. You're either pulling them out of retirement, getting them to leave school early, which you don't want, or you're, or, or you're taking them from another employer by paying them more money. And that feeds into the wage aspect, the wage price spiral of concern. That's affecting it. A lot of people took time off during the COVID pandemic and didn't come back, and you can see it in this right here. This is a labor force participation rate. You have people who retired, people who just said, I don't want to work anymore. People said, I'm going to do something different. There's a real tidage of workers, and that's feeding into inflation. So it's not any one thing, and that's one of the reasons why it makes inflation a little bit more difficult to control. So what is the cure for higher prices? It's kind of ironic. What is the cure for higher prices? It's higher prices. You make something more expensive, people consume less of it. Or if something's more expensive, supply chain kicks in and you produce more of it. But right now, what the Fed is trying to do is raise prices to try to tamp down demand to get things more in control. And the way they're raising prices is they're raising interest rates. So anything which is bought on time, anything you have to finance, whether it be an automobile or construction of a new hospital, you're going to have to borrow money to do that. If you make borrowing more expensive, the demand for vehicles will go down, or maybe you'll postpone some of those decisions about expanding your operations. And that's where kind of the concern is, that they're going to raise price, interest rates so high, keep them there too long, that it's not just going to have the soft landing, but a hard landing of the economy. This is the guy right now who's administering the, the medicine, Jerome Powell. Had a meeting just this week. They raised interest rates another 25 basis points, a quarter of a percent. Of the last nine meetings the Fed has had, they've raised interest rates eight times. Want to get some idea that's what it looks like? You know, they, 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 they made them really low during the pandemic because they're trying to stimulate the economy. And now they're raising interest rates to try to get the economy to cool off just enough so that we don't have runaway inflation, trying to get inflation back under control. You know, it works all the way through the economy. Then you can see the Fed raises interest rates. You can see what happens with mortgage rates. At one time, they got above 7%, but right now, they're around 6.1, 6.2. But it makes buying a house more expensive. It raises that monthly note. And so what happens? We sell fewer homes. And you can see this is uh, on an annualized basis. Back in November of 2021, we're selling homes at the rate of over a little over $6 million a year. Now we're down to a rate of around $4 million a year. Because people just can't afford it. 
and hoping that making that interest rate higher, making that note higher, is going to depress demand just a little bit and house prices will get under control. So the, the banks out there are really worried about this, the big banks. You know, they've got a, a whole team of economists that look at this trying to figure out what's going on. And they are really worried and they're, and they're already starting to set money aside because they're worried about loan defaults. Some of the things that if you read what the banks are putting out, what their concerns are, one of them is this, is the savings rate, because consumers aren't saving any money. They're spending their savings to try to maintain their lifestyles. They're worried that the long-term implications for that. Though there's single-family housing starts. You know, the first one I showed you was existing homes. These are new homes. And what, the, the impact on housing, it's not just the impact on housing. So if you think about building a house, they're the jobs of building it, but think about everything in the supply chain. Think about the lumber. Think about the laminate flooring. Think about the window coverings. Think about the appliances. Think about the composition shingles, all those sort of things. And it's not just that. My wife and I bought a house uh, a couple years ago, if I can use ourselves as an example. And when we moved to the house, we made a decision. We're not moving the living room furniture. <laughs> we're going to set it out by the curb. I mean, well, we had, it was heavy trash day, so. <laughs> <laughs> so we just didn't sit up. But the thing is, when people buy a new house, don't you like to put new stuff in it rather than move the old stuff? So that affects, thank you for nodding, <laughs> that affects the whole retail supply chain. People want to put new, new furniture, new, all sorts of new stuff. And so it ripples throughout the economy. So that's one of the concerns. There's, it's also getting harder just to borrow because the banks are so worried about what's going to happen with the economy, they're, they're tightening up and they're not lending as much, or they're, they're being much more careful about how they lend. And so this is another concern. These are the sort of things which could really slow down the economy. So are we going to go into recession? This is a survey of the Federal Reserve Bank. I'm not the Federal Reserve. I mean, this, is, this is Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal does a survey of economists and asks them all these questions about the economy and about jobs, about interest rates, about oil prices and about likelihood of a recession. And, and based on the last survey, they came up with a 61% probability of a recession this year. I need to let you know, I don't believe this. I disagree with this, and I'm going to show you why. Okay. So this is an organization I'm a member of, National Association for Business Economics, where we survey our members and ask them similar questions. And this one was, if in a recession, if there's a recession in 23, when will it start? And you know, over half of my colleagues think it's going to happen the first half of the year. I need to let you know, I should have put up here, uh, don't know or, or not applicable, because I don't think we're going to be in a recession this year. But the problem is so many of my peers think we do. So many of the Wall Street economists think we do. And I'm going to show you why. You know? <laughs> okay. you know, my concern is, is that, that you guys all played Ouija. You know, and it's just really, really reading your own vibes. And I'm concerned that's what's going to happen with the economy right now. We are going to talk ourselves into a recession. We're going to believe it so strongly that we're going to act like we're in one, even though we aren't. My concern is it's going to become a self-fulfilling prophecy. We're all going to believe that's in a recession, or we're going to hear so much about recession, we're going to pull back on our own spending, or we're going to pull back on our hiring decisions or investment decisions. And we're going to make it happen, even though the data doesn't say we're in one. So you know, this, this concept of this inevitability of a recession, I don't think a recession is inevitable. And I want to give you three, exa three. <laughs> three examples of things that I think everybody in this room, or a majority in this room, thought were inevitable, that were highly likely, that we thought were going to happen, and did not happen. Let's start with the war in the Ukraine. It's almost a year ago. Remember when Russia first invaded the Ukraine and we thought that Ukraine couldn't last more than a few weeks. Russia would be in Kiev soon and Russia would soon be dominating Kiev. Look at how it's turned out. Was it inevitable that Russia overran the, would quickly overrun the Ukraine? No. You know, Ukraine continues to bloody Russia's nose. So that's an example of something everybody thought was inevitable but did not happen. How about this one? Back in the elections in the fall, we thought it was inevitable there would be a red wave and the Republicans would sweep through and they'd control the House and had a really good chance of controlling the Senate. 
And look what happened. Russian, excuse me, Russians, Republicans, excuse me, that's not a Freudian slip. <laughs> <laughs> the Republicans barely controlled the House, and they couldn't even elect a speaker. So this is an example of something everybody thought was inevitable. They knew it was going to happen, but it didn't happen. And how about Bitcoin? How about crypto? Everybody thought it was the best investment of the world. It can only go up. And look at how crypto has crashed. So one of the things in this conventional wisdom out there that we are, it's inevitable that we go into recession, please throw it out the window. Please set it aside. It's not inevitable that we go into recession. It, it only happened if we continue to talk that it's going to. So there are three possibilities out there, and this is based on a forecast I put together in November and released in December, and I am concerned that maybe I've, I'm even a little more pessimistic in this than I should have been, but let me explain how I think we might, if a possibility there might be a mild recession. And as this is inflation going back to 1970 up to 1990, and this is what the Fed was dealing with 20, 30, what, 40 years, whatever, we were dealing with way back then. Inflation had been around since the 60s, and it had gotten as high as almost 15%. So the Fed had to raise interest rates really high, up to almost 20%, and keep them there for a long time to finally kill inflation and get the economy back on an even keel. This is inflation now. It's already turned down. It never got as high as it was in, in, in the 70s and 60s. So the Fed's not going to have to raise interest rates as high or keep them there as long so it's less likely for there to be damage in the economy as a result. That's one case for a mild recession. The other is this is a survey that the conference board puts together. They ask CEOs, you know, what do they expect to be happening next year? Most of them expect a recession this year. What do most corporations do if they expect a recession? Hiring freeze and layoffs, right? 44% expect to expand their workforce, even though they're going to be in a recession. Isn't it counterintuitive? I mean, what's one of the, the easiest metrics to measure a recession? Are we creating jobs or losing jobs? We're still going to be creating jobs. Maybe not quite as many. You know, part of the thing is we still have a very tight labor market. Job openings, the data came out this week. 11 million job openings in the U.S. right now. In a normal economy, we should have about six and a half. The labor market's still real tight. Maybe that's one of the reasons why CEOs are so reluctant to let their employees go, because they know if they let them go, they're not going to be able to find them when everything's picked back up. They can kind of moderate it. What happens with capital spending? Normally, you scale back on your investments during a recession. You're going to continue to invest. Counterintuitive. Does that seem like a recession if, if corporations are still going to be hiring and, and, and investing? Yeah. Hold, 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 please hold it to the end. Hold it to the end. So this is uh, Wall Street Journal, that same group of economists we surveyed earlier. And they're seeing a very mild recession. Maybe that's one of the reasons why the CEOs are reluctant to lay people off or stop investing, because they need to be prepared, because it's only going to be short and shallow. We need to be prepared, because it's, it's not going to be very long before things start growing in. So that's that. This is another survey, the Philadelphia Fed, different set of economists. These guys aren't seeing a recession at all. They're just seeing extremely weak growth. So yeah, there's a good chance that whatever we have could be a very mild recession, if a recession at all. So how about a near miss? I'm leaning more and more to this case here. Now look at the headlines. GDP in the third quarter, stronger than previously thought. The government issues three different estimates. The first estimate came in at 2.6%, the second one 2.9%, the third one finally came in at 3.2%. As more data came in, the Bureau of Economic Analysis would say, you know, something the economy is actually performing better than we thought. I think that's kind of the general theme. The economy is performing a lot better than people thought. GDP numbers for the fourth quarter came out just this last week, 2.9%. I mean, that's after adjusting for inflation. Long-term average growth for the U.S. economy is about 2%. So not only are we growing, we're still growing at a rate faster than the U.S. has long-term. Job claims, would you expect there to be layoffs now? Show up, job claims keep on inching down. And yes, you hear about a lot of jobless claims, a lot of layoffs in the tech sector. Uh, I'm trying to, to get a handle on that. Uh, I've heard 100,000 jobs lost in the tech sector since the layoffs began. 100,000 sounds like a big number, doesn't it? Well, the US has 153 million jobs. 
So 100,000 jobs out of 153 million. It's painful if you've lost your job, but it doesn't have the same sort of impact as it was in the pandemic when we lost 22 million. And the other is, you know, this is, I pulled this from the, this is what five years worth of jobless claims looks like. That's what jobless claims look like for the last year. You can definitely see them trending down. Does this seem like a recession when you're looking at data like this? Numbers just released this morning, 500,000 jobs. Long-term average for the U.S. is about 185, 190,000. So we're producing but almost three times the long-term average. You know, I think they had, had it right when, when CNN said it blew out all estimates. Give you some idea where growth has been over the last 12, 13 months. That dotted line is the long-term average. You can see we're still creating jobs above the long-term average. So why, why, why when you see something like this do you think we're in a recession? Why? None of this indicates recession to me. Does it indicate recession to you guys? There is a possibility that something happens that's deep and protracted, but that's the sort of thing, if something happens that we have no control over, something unexpected, like COVID. No one saw COVID coming and what it did to the economy. The war in the Ukraine could get worse. Something could happen in China that upsets the world economy. Cyber attack on the West. Or we've been underinvesting in the oil and gas industry for years, and we could see a spike in crude and gasoline prices. But those are kind of black swan, one-off events. You can't plan for those. But if something like this did happen, yeah, we could have a recession. So the probabilities, 50% mild, 30% near miss, 20% something deep. And I, like I said, I, I put these numbers together when I was working back in November, and I almost wonder if I should flip the 50 and the 30. Because as more data comes in, I continue to see strength in the economy. I don't see weakness. So if the end is near, if this expansion that we're going on is near, what's it going to look like? Well, if we do have a recession, it's going to be short and shallow. If, 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 if we have one. Because the economy is so strong. If the Fed pushes interest rates just a little bit further to try to, but we're still shortage of labor, short, uh, lots of savings. I mean, just, we're just in such, so much better shape than people realize. So the question is, what path, what path will Houston take? As Houston does, sometimes it follows the U.S. economy, sometimes it goes its own way. I need to let you know Houston's economy is really quite strong right now. Actually, my 40 years of studying the economy, this is probably the healthiest I've seen it in four decades. Now, the 80s were, were a lot of fun, but that wasn't healthy. This, this is healthy growth. If we look at initial claims for unemployment benefits, a proxy for layoffs in the region, it looks a little bit like the one I showed you for the U.S. We don't see any increase in people filing for unemployment, so there's not an increase in layoffs in the region. This, ironically, this may be a good time, it may be a time when we're glad that we're not exposed to tech, the way Austin or San Francisco or San Diego are. If you look at the Purchasing Managers Index, if you guys seen me present before, you know this is one of my favorites. Institute for Supply Management asks the purchasing managers out there questions about backlogs and sales and employment, crunches all these numbers, come up with an index whenever the index is above the neutral point signified by the red line. It's a sign the economy is expanding, and you can see it's still above the red line. What's happening with oil and gas? Survey that the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas did in December asking what, what does the energy industry plan to do in this region this year? But, you know, roughly, what is that, 60%, 64% expect to at least expand, if not a lot, at least a little bit. So we're not seeing a contraction in oil and gas this year. Container traffic through the Port of Houston, loaded containers, not empty containers. They do move containers in and out as a reposition, but containers that are full of stuff. There's stuff that we have manufactured and we're shipping overseas or that are coming in to help with our supply chains. A record number of containers were handled last year. Still seeing growth. Construction contracts, absolutely incredible year for construction last year. Passenger traffic, doing really well. Vehicle sales, record for vehicle sales. Well, not a record, but best year going back to 2016. 
I mean, if you look at what's going on in Houston, this incredible amount of construction that's going on, incredible activity at the port, people are starting to fly again. Consumers feel fairly confident that they're buying cars. I mean, Houston's in really, really good shape, except for one or two areas. One of them is home sales, and that's because of interest rates and high prices. And you can see, if you look what happened at the early part of last year, we saw home sales go up, the uh, kind of greenish grayish bar, slate color is what happened in 2021. 2022 is the same month, the, the year before. And if you want to look at what happened, you can see how selling fewer and fewer homes compared to the same month last year. That's interest rates. That's, that's the one area, one of the two areas I see softening, and the other is apartment market, multifamily. But those are the only two areas that I see weakness in the economy in Houston. And that's part of adjusting the interest rates. So we have a lot of momentum going into 2023, a lot of momentum in 2023, that I think we will do fine. Actually, when you apply the probabilities of a recession to Houston and look at job growth, I don't see a single scenario where Houston loses jobs this year. Even if we have a recession, Houston will not lose jobs this year because we have so much momentum, so much strength built up in 2022 to carry us well into this year. If you want to look at areas that we expect to see growing, you can see it up there on the screen. Even seeing some growth in oil and gas because they're, they're going to need to expand some production because of just how strong the economy is. So, you know, this is my biggest concern that we're going to talk ourselves into a recession. I mean, I showed you the data up there. I mean, look at the data. The data doesn't signify recession. It signifies growth. But all we do is talk about recession. The holidays are over with. I had lots of family in my house, maybe too much family in my house. I got in an argument with a cousin, and he said, we're in a recession. I said, no, we're not. And he goes, yes, we are. I go, no, we're not. He goes, yes, we are. And I go, can I show you the data? He goes, I don't need to see the data. I know we're in a recession. How do you, argue? you know, that sort of attitude, that sort of thinking, denial is the danger which could put us, you know, we're going to be talking among ourselves about, yes, we're in a recession, and it's going to affect our behavior. The biggest danger to us right now is ourselves, our talking ourselves into recession when the data doesn't show it. The U.S. created 500,000 jobs last month. 500,000 jobs. That's an incredible number. So, okay, shift a little bit. Quite, you guys didn't know they'd be, where's the math teacher? <laughs> See, Levi. <laughs> real, real, real quick math test, okay. Recession math. How many recessions since the end of World War II? Twelve. How many recoveries since the end of World War II? Twelve. We, we get caught up in if there's a recession, we think of it as a terminal illness, as a fatal disease, as something chronic that we're going to have to live through. Recessions, by and large, are really short-lived phenomena. A recession occurs to correct something in the economy. It's a way to borrow a healthcare metaphor. It's, it's like a fiscal therapy. And what we're trying to do right now is correct inflation, correct it by raising prices. So what you're seeing right here, a grab from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis website, that blue line is employment for the U.S. going back to the end of World War II. Look how that line just pretty much goes up. Those little columns, those are actually recessions. Look at how wide that gap is. Look how much white space there is up there versus the gray space. You know, the point I'm trying to make is the normal state of the U.S. economy is expansion. The normal state for Houston's economy is growth. We have periods where we may slip a little bit and slide a little bit, but those periods always end, like my joke about 12 recessions, 12 recoveries. But we should not, even if, 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 if we slip into a recession this year, it's not a permanent state. It's like, it's like going through physical therapy to get healthy and come out the other side. So to give you one other illustration, I actually counted the number of months the U.S. was in recession since World War II and the number of months we were in expansion. And you can see it up there. I think it's pretty telling. But 86% of the time, the U.S. economy is expanding. 14% of the time, it's in contraction. We shouldn't lose sight of that. 
So if we do talk ourselves into recession, which I hope we don't, it will be short-lived. So final slide, if I was going to summarize it all in one image, left-hand side is short-term outlook for Houston and the U.S., right side is long-term outlook. A little cloudy right now, but there are some patches of blue. Long-term, still sun on the horizon, still growth. We'll do fine. We just need to get through whatever 2023 has in store for us. With that, I'm done. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time.